Hello and welcome to Down the Scope. Today we'll be looking at the anatomy of shark gills. How do they manage to extract oxygen from the water? As usual, you can access fully zoomable digital versions of all the slides via the website at downthescope.co.uk. Links to the slides are in the video description. Gills are the respiratory organs of jawless and jawed fish. The basic structure of the gill is the same in lampreys through to trout, but there are a few anatomic differences between major groups of fish, some of them advantageous and some disadvantageous. The basic function of the gill is to provide a large surface area interface between water and blood to allow gas exchange. In sharks, they also assume some roles which we would normally associate with the kidney, such as excretion of nitrogen-containing compounds like ammonia, and control of the ion and pH balance of the blood. This combination of functions makes the gill one of the most complex animal organs. Dogfish have five gills on each side, but there are up to seven in other species of shark. We can see the five gill arches in this section on slide 237. You'll notice that the first gill arch has functional tissue only on the caudal aspect. The other four gill arches have functional tissue on both the caudal and cranial aspect. Let's have a look at a schematic of the gill structure to see if we can relate it to what's on this slide. Here we can see a diagram of two gill arches. Each gill arch is supported by a central bit of cartilage, the arch cartilage. From the arch cartilage, there's an extension of supportive connective tissue extending down to the jaw. This is the interbranchial septum, which divides the anterior and posterior hemibranchs, which support the functional units of the gill. In the slide, we can identify the arch cartilage here and here. The interbranchial septum and the hemibranchs on either side, the anterior or cranial and the posterior or caudal hemibranchs. Just below the arch cartilage, there are three blood vessels, a pair of efferent branchial arteries and a single afferent branchial artery. We'll come on to circulation in the gills a bit later. Between the interbranchial septum and the hemibranch, there is a space for the water to flow called the septal channel. If we switch to a transverse section like slide 246, we can see the functional unit of the gill much better. Here we have the interbranchial septum of two gill arches supported by more segments of cartilage. These are called the branchial rays. Lining the interbranchial septum is a hemibranch made up of a collection of finger-like extensions called gill filaments. These are separated by septal channels. Each gill filament extends further projections out called lamellae. Now we're going to have to get down to a cellular level to explore how the gill performs its many functions. If we look at a single lamella, we can begin to see how its structure allows gas exchange that is, get rid of carbon dioxide and absorb oxygen between the water and the blood. Each lamella is filled with little blood channels, such as this one here, for example, and this one here. These culminate in a larger channel at the tip called the outer marginal channel. And we can see an example here, here, and here. You can see there's only a few cells separating the water from the shark's blood. Pillar cells line the blood channels within the lamellae. They give the lamella a string of pearl appearance, with each blood channel separated by a pillar cell uh, with another blood channel on the other side. The pillar cell extends processes called flanges that line the blood channel on either side. The flanges are only 0.02 to 1 micrometer thick to minimise the distance between the blood and water, so helping the diffusion of gases. I found an excellent example of a pillar cell and its flanges on this slide. 
Within this view, we can see a pillar cell here in the middle with its nucleus and the flanges extending to surround the two blood channels on either side. You can really appreciate just how small the distance is between the blood and water. The red line demonstrating the distance here measures three micrometers. For reference, a thin human hair is about 17 micrometers thick. Most of the other cell nuclei that, that you can see lining the lamellae belong to pavement cells. For example, these two oval nuclei here and here, and this nucleus just here, will belong to pavement cells. You can see how the nuclei are placed over the columns of the pillar cell. This is to allow decreased epithelial thickness over the blood channels. Pavement cells have a protective function just like any other epithelium. Using an electron microscope, you can see the surface membrane forms tiny micro ridges. It's thought that these help to anchor mucus to the gills, which protects against bacteria and other foreign material. When looking at a histology slide, we have to remember that this is a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional structure. I found a beautiful diagram in a paper on fish gill structure by Kenneth Olson. Here we can see a lamellae image with an electron microscope cut in half, just like we could see on the slide. We can see the pillar cells separating the blood channels with red blood cells, these large dark areas with a central nucleus within them. These are all covered by pavement cells and we can see a pavement cell nucleus just here. This electron micrograph has been turned into a 3D reconstruction, which looks like an empty hall where the blood channels would be. This is supported by struts, which are the pillar cells. Here the name pillar cell really seems appropriate, as you can imagine these cells holding up the whole lamella structure, allowing blood cells to flow between them. The staining in slide 241 allows us to identify another kind of cell. Among the darkly staining pavement and pillar cells, there are large, lighter staining polygonal cells with large, round nuclei. They're more abundant in the filament epithelium compared to the lamellae, so that their size doesn't interfere with gas exchange. These are mitochondria-rich cells, or chloride cells, which have an intimate association with the circulatory system. And we can just about make out a blood vessel with a kind of turquoisey colour running up the middle of this gill filament. The mitochondria-rich cells, often shortened to MRC, are used to regulate the salt content of the blood and the acid-base balance. Some of them are specialised for hydrogen ion excretion, whilst another subpopulation of these cells express proteins that will excrete bicarbonate ions. A couple of other cell types are present, but difficult to identify in these sections. There will be goblet cells which produce mucin to cover the gills with a protective layer. Additionally, there will be neuroepithelial cells which sense oxygen levels and can regulate blood flow through the gills. Now that we've gone over the anatomy from macroscopic down to the individual cells, it's worth mentioning how water and blood flow through the gills. Water enters the oral cavity through the mouth or through spiracles. From here, it's forced or pumped into the branchial cavity where the gills are. Water then flows through the interlamellar spaces between the lamellae where gas exchange occurs. Once the water has passed through the interlamellar channels, it will encounter the interbranchial septum, which channels the water towards the parabranchial cavity using the septal channels between gill filaments. From the parabranchial cavity, water leaves through the gill slits. There's an important anatomic difference in gill structure between sharks and bony fish, in that the interbranchial septum in bony fish is not complete as it is in sharks. While this means that sharks have more robust gills, the water also meets more resistance. To compensate for the added resistance caused by the interbranchial septum, sharks have larger interlamellar spaces and therefore fewer lamellae per gill filament than fish. In terms of blood supply, there are two components to the gill, the respiratory vasculature, which is there to be oxygenated, and the non-respiratory vasculature, which is there to supply oxygen to the cells making up the gills. 
In the respiratory vasculature, deoxygenated blood enters the gill arch through the afferent branchial artery. In order to explain the vasculature, I've prepared a schematic diagram. Here, deoxygenated blood is represented in blue and oxygenated blood is represented in red. Blood enters the gills via the afferent branchial artery. This artery splits into various afferent distributing arteries, which travel down the hemibranch and provide afferent filament arteries to each of the gill filaments. Within the filament, the afferent filament artery has two branches with anastomoses between them, or little windows which allow blood to pass between the two branches of the artery. This forms a structure called the corpus cavernosum. The function of this web of blood vessels is to provide a kind of hydrostatic skeleton that maintains the gill filament structure so it doesn't flop all over the place. From the corpus cavernosum, the blood passes to the lamella arterioles and flows through the lamellae where gas exchange occurs. Once out of the lamellae, the newly oxygenated blood flows back to the systemic circulation via an efferent filament artery, which then passes into the efferent branchial artery. These structures can be quite hard to make out on the slides. We can identify the efferent and afferent branchial arteries from their position within the gill arch but the other blood vessels can be quite difficult to identify. In general, we rely on the presence of red blood cells to be able to find blood vessels. Where you see channels lined by a single layer of cells, such as these ones here, with spindle-shaped squashed nuclei, these are blood vessels. The cells lining blood vessels are called endothelium. Despite their rather plain appearance, they're highly specialised and act as arbiters of what can pass in and out of blood vessels. For example, they have special receptors that will attach to immune cells and allow them to pass between the endothelial cells and access tissue during an infection. Within the lamellae, blood and water flow in opposite directions, forming a countercurrent exchange system. This ensures that the concentration gradient for oxygen is maintained all along the system. If we imagine that fully oxygenated water flowed in the same direction as blood, in this case down the screen, only a maximum of 50% of the oxygen would be transferred, as then the concentration of oxygen in the water and the blood would be the same, and there would be no concentration gradient allowing for diffusion. In a countercurrent system, despite the fact that the blood is gaining oxygen, it is constantly passing water with a higher oxygen concentration so the concentration gradient is maintained and gas exchange will still occur. So that's a quick review of gill structure in the dogfish. If you want to know more, I can recommend the chapter in Fish Physiology on Elasmobranch gill structure by Nicholas Wegner, which I used as a primary source for the information in this video. A link to the chapter is in the description. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to find an answer. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos on the anatomy and histology of the dogfish and other animals. If you want to see slides of tissue from other animals, then you can visit the website. There's a link in the comments. Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.